We in the graduate division would like to welcome you to our series on teaching effectiveness. There is a strategic intent by the graduate division to foster teaching effectiveness through discussion and learning, both from each other and from professionals across a number of disciplines. Rather than advocating one best way, the Teaching Effectiveness Initiative is rooted in the belief that there are many pockets of excellence within Wharton. Because of the variety of teaching methods and approaches that coexist in the Wharton classroom and that the students encounter in the MBA curriculum, people have learned to succeed in many different ways. Hence, there is a tremendous potential to reach new heights in the classroom through dialogue and sharing of ideas and best practices. There is, however, no reason to limit the exchange of learning to what's available inside Wharton. Indeed, there's no reason to limit the exchange of learning to the profession of teaching. Professionals in many different walks of life face problems and demands similar to the ones encountered in the Wharton classroom. We could learn from those professions. We could learn from the outside as well. Barbara Shannon is an MBA student from the class of 1998 who has been instrumental in designing and implementing this initiative. The Vega Dialogue is one example of the potential to learn from another profession, to learn from the outside. This tape provides us with an example of an artist that copes with an audience that eats and drinks during a performance. It also highlights the importance of preparation and persistence. We'll see that you don't have to be a born performer to command an audience. This event was inspired by the emergence of a more formal focus on classroom excellence at Wharton. Students and faculty have recognized the potential benefit of a dialogue on this subject. Thus, the Initiative for Classroom Effectiveness is a joint effort between the graduate office and the student body. The Vega Dialogue is not an isolated event, but hopefully the first of many such creative and inspiring occasions to foster discussion about teaching. Good enough to invite Suzanne Vega. Suzanne Vega has been nice enough to accept the invitation and come. And with, I don't want to eat up any time, without further ado, Gabe, no show. <laughs> Thank you. I would like to, by any means, I want to say two words of introduction to Suzanne. And, um, and so I, I prepared a little three paragraph introduction. First paragraph reads She drinks milkshakes. <laughs> She even eats meat occasionally, though the common perception of her is that of an ascetic poet, one who only eats when nature absolutely demands it. She's actually quite earthly. Um, while on a tour in Texas, she shocked a record exec by saying she wanted to go shopping. And uh, the executive replied, I'm so glad you're a regular girl. Um, she said, I have a reputation for being pacifist, vegetarian, Buddhist, ethereal, and frail. Susan uh, and she with a smile says, and it's not like that at all. Uh, Suzanne is a Grammy Award winning singer, prolific writer, and according to uh, Jeremy Helger of the New York Review of Records, she is widely regarded as by the music industry one of the most brilliant songwriters of her generation. Probably best known for her song Luca. And Tom Steiner, released in 1987, she's also recognized for copious attention to detail <coughs> and follows a rigorous method of evaluating her performance for improvement. And that's the reason why um, we thought of this event. Actually, I, um, the inspiration for this event was the incredible commitment of Barbara Shannon and another student uh, and the reps in general to uh, teaching effectiveness and helping us really understand what this teaching is all about and working with us to uh, make us all better teachers. So uh, in that spirit, that's the inspiration for this event and when I uh, actually we invited Suzanne here for a different reason for uh, a class on strategy formation but as we were talking and planning that class, it became clear that Suzanne has some fairly elaborate techniques for assessing her gigs. And if you think about what we do in the classroom, especially in the core, we do sort of a mini gig each time we teach. We do three performances. <laughs> and so that kind of triggered the parallels, and we started saying, oh, no, that's, that's interesting. Maybe let's explore and see what, what kind of uh, parallels and differences are there. And 
other things that came out were, for example, the issue of image management. And Suzanne learned from her experience that very quickly, the first few performances you give may determine the success of your gig. And that's very important how you manage your image. And then the question is, is there any such a thing for us as an instructor? Do we manage our image? What is it that we manage at all? I, at least I know that the very first sessions you teach in the core pretty much set the tone for how the course is going to, going to unravel. Another, <laughs> another um, interesting point Suzanne made, an interesting remark, inspiring remark, was that her best performance ever was with her back to the audience. She, was, she, she knew that the audience was there, but she was giving looking uh, in the other direction and who started playing with the idea does it have any implications for us <laughs> what does it mean for teaching could we teach with our back to the audience or could we teach speaking from the back of the room what what kind of dynamics would that trigger so with that introduction i uh, probably would pass over control to the team of co coordinators for this event or co moderators i would say is that still the plan yeah. <laughs> and uh, so a little bit yeah <laughs> Jane, whom you all know, and, and, and Barbara Shannon, and so uh, what we hope to have is we'll learn a little bit more from Suzanne how she does it, how she does kick feedback. Uh, maybe then Anthony will share with us um, his side of his gigs, how does he manage <laughs> his open gigs, and then uh, maybe we can open it for, for a discussion. So. Part of the premise for putting this together is a hypothesis that I've heard Anjani and, and some other professors here talk about, which is this concept that um, contrary to what sometimes we hear in academia, which is the best professors are, and this is analogous to performing, are extroverted, you know, high energy personality types with some shtick or trick, you know, that that they uniquely know and that it's not transferable. And we've had many conversations um, that in fact teaching is a learnable um, skill. And I, I know Anjani has, um, has some experience with that and interesting ideas to share. And, and from the brief conversation we had earlier, you said for you, performing is actually learned and not that easy. And yeah. I just thought maybe we could have some sharing of how this was for each of you. People can talk about what's difficult and uh, share experiences on that. So as Barbara said, I thought but uh, I might offer myself as a living testimonial to the claim that the teaching is, <coughs> is actually a learnable craft. And that uh, in my case, it was rather a painful learning experience. In my students' case, it was even more painful. <laughs> but it took me years to learn to listen to the audience, to actually receive this feedback. And, most of us who are here are here because at some point we had teachers that were truly inspiring and that sort of landed us eventually into the university. And my, my own idea of teaching was actually rather different, having gone through a graduate program. Uh, people I admired as great teachers and minds were those who, in some cases, could actually barely communicate. There was a Chinese professor in mathematics who didn't speak much English, but the way he could open up the sort of vistas of inner beauty of mathematics was, was what they looked up to, looked up to as graduate students. And my premise when I started teaching here was that your role as a teacher was, was really to uh, present the elegance of the subject matter that in itself was enough of motivation for students. So my operating mode was here I am and, and I teach a subject that's uh, whose relevance is not immediately obvious to most of the students. It's a required subject, so they have to take it. And uh, so my approach was, uh, here I am, here's linear programming, which is one of the things I teach. <laughs> and I think you ought to learn it, because I think it's terribly elegant. And it didn't occur to me for a long time as being not particularly uh, convincing as an argument with the students. And, and the one thing I learned was to appreciate the difference between <coughs> graduate school and graduate professional school. This is, as you know, so then, an MBA program. Uh, so the audience here today is a mix of faculty, some of whom are actually really star teachers. Um, and 
students uh, who are academic representatives of their sections. Um, Barbara is not, and Barbara is in the second year, there are some first year students. And they are all, they all be engaged in this ongoing discussion we have about teaching its quality, its effectiveness. And for me, it was, uh, it took me a long time to, to, to appreciate the difference between graduate school and graduate professional school. And, and to realize that to filter things through this lens of professional relevance, uh, when we choose a topic in the classroom and the way we present it, that filtering is not necessarily to make subject matter intellectually valued. That it, it means asking a set of hard questions about what the students ought to be learning. And particularly what the students ought to take away from that and retain 10 years later when they've forgotten the details of whatever it is you're trying to teach them. And, and that did lead me to think differently uh, over time of how we teach and what we teach in the classroom. But uh, whenever uh, students have talked to me about uh, issues of teaching quality, I often offer myself as the reason why institutions need to take a longer term view of, uh, of supporting uh, particularly junior faculty who come in and have not been typically exposed to the classroom. And for a lot of us who start teaching, uh, it's trial by fire. Larry Robbins runs a program that actually helps uh, give feedback to faculty so that you can get yourself videotaped. I've always been too scared, actually. I've never gotten myself to hear that. Larry has actually tried to get me to be in front of the camera and, and like, like, you guys, because uh, I don't want to draw any parables, but I've always been <laughs> shy at the camera myself. And, but, but as, as I was said, that's one of the, the premises that I now believe in, that you can take almost anyone off the street. Uh, in my case, someone with no natural ability or charisma, not even the knowledge of English as a first language. And over time, they can learn to be better teachers. And I, I was curious to get re your reactions to this claim, that uh, is teaching or performance, in your case, an intrinsic gift that you have to have? Or is it something that uh, can be acquired? Uh, there's clearly, the only predictors in, in the case of teaching, I guess, are a passion for the subject. Uh, I think that's essential. And secondly, a kind of desire to proselytize. I see myself almost as a missionary uh, in front of the audience. And that gives me a certain amount of uh, energy in the classroom. Um, because there are moments, very occasionally, but there are some moments when I see that almost everyone in the classroom sort of lashed down to what I'm going to say next. And so I savor those moments, uh, few and far between as they are. <laughs> so there is that sense almost of power, I guess, uh, that, that drives a lot of us to excelling in the classroom. There is, however, one thing I, I just want to, I don't want me to go on around in this way. But there's one thing that I want to mention also, that what I brought to bear in my own thinking about teaching in the beginning was that teaching as a craft, as an art, is very different than entertaining. In fact, entertaining uh, is almost, uh, to, to try to entertain is almost to demean in some way the kind of teaching, in that you could almost aim for, for that popularity. and not focus on the substance, on that long-term learning. And uh, I remember many years ago now, some of the senior faculty in my department held a seminar on how the junior faculty can become better teachers. And at one point, uh, they put up a little list of bullet points, uh, which they said were myths about teaching in the MBA program. And one of them said, students merely want to be entertained that they think was, was a myth. And I remember sitting in the audience and thinking, that's really true. Uh, <laughs> another, another bullet point was, uh, in order to be perceived as good teachers, you, you have to tell a lot of war stories and jokes and such. And that it's not the substance of teaching that, that students really care about. And I, at least in my case, did start out as a teacher thinking largely 
that those things were true. And I think I've come to appreciate that it's not true, that indeed students will respond to, to a genuine intellectual engagement, but you do have to think very carefully about what is it that they are looking for, and to try to, to motivate them to, to almost proselytize, as I said, to, to your faith, in this case, a particular subject matter. So those are just a few remarks I want to make. I, I'd like uh, this to become uh, an engaging discussion between all of you and Suzanne with respect to these or any other issues surrounding teaching. Uh, we were a little bit, when Gabriel first uh, mentioned this idea, I was almost uh, hesitant that uh, by doing a panel of this kind, are we almost implicitly endorsing the view that teaching is performance. <laughs> but it's a question worth asking. <laughs> so, but uh, no further ado, let me just hand it back right over to you. Now, I'm, I'm, I just something. Um, I well, the issue that I think is interesting is that, um, obviously, you're talking about uh, teaching, the difference between teaching and entertainment, and then you used another word, which is performance. So there are three really different things. There's entertainment, there's teaching, you know, which you do, and then there's performance, which we both do. And there's different kinds of entertainment. There, are, there is entertainment that is also instructive. Um, I mean, I remember as a student, uh, yes, if you have a teacher who's trying to pander to you or trying to be entertaining, then ultimately you don't have respect for them, and maybe it is demeaning to use your word. Um, obviously, it's my job, so it's how demeaning can it be? But um, so it's an interesting it's an interesting question, though, because there's degrees of it, and both of us, I think, are performers. Um, I remember seeing two flamenco dancers in Spain, and the star of this fl uh, flamenco troupe was this woman who was really elegant and beautiful to watch, and the reason she was so magnetic is because she was so reserved. Um, she was very reserved, but you had this feeling of her overcoming something tremendous to present it to you, and you, you felt um, amazed watching her. And then you had another female performer who came out, and she would want to give you everything. You know, she was, she was witty, she was, she was sexy, she was uh, flying everywhere, and then ultimately you kind of lost interest after five minutes because there was, she wasn't overcoming anything, she was just sort of giving 110% it's sort of splashy, it was very splashy and very showy, and ultimately you found yourself wishing that the other woman would come back because she, because she was so reserved um, that there was a sort of, uh, she could draw you in because of the, the power that she was generating in overcoming that reserve, which created some sort of magnetism or charisma. So I mean, maybe that's what we're talking about in terms of performance. Um, whether or not you're entertaining or instructive or whatever, you know, I try and be instructive in my way and I'm sure you try and be entertaining in your way as well. Yeah. Um, just listening, I wonder if you would relate a little bit of um, what your process was of learning to be a performer. Um, and in that, I think there may be some links to the conversation that we're having, which um, I'm going to boil down to, um, you know, entertainment in the... Uh, in not the positive sense of the word, versus substance. Right. And knowing that you grappled with that question, in terms of your own craft, the substance of the art and the poetry, and your, your very real connection to the work, and yet this commercialized music industry machine of which you are a part, and sort of the balance of those two. But I think it would be very interesting to start with the story of how you learned can I just, to perform. Can I just add one thing? It's related to this. Um, if you could also uh, comment on sort of this issue of self-awareness. And what I mean by that, not, not after the fact, but for instance, um, during the performance. Wow, all right, that's a lot of stuff. Um, okay, yes, but you have to like remind me. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I guess the way I learned to perform was simply by um, being rejected. Uh, for about two years at this one club in New York City. Uh, there was a club called The Bitter End, and every couple of Mondays I would go down with my guitar and play for Stefan, who was the owner of the club, and he would sit with his plate of pork chops and, um, <laughs> and you know, potatoes and beer, and he'd sort of lean back, you know, be 
eating and I would be singing. So I'd sing my three songs and um, he'd come off stage and go, well, you know, that was very nice and you know, you're very quiet, you're very shy, you're, you're very timid. So I, I don't think so. And I would come back every two months, you know, it was like every two months and I did this for two years. You know, finally, it dawned on me that maybe I should go to another venue. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I had this image in my mind of like building my way up from the bitter end, then to Folk City, and then to the bottom line. So for two years I kept banging at this bottom thing. I felt like I had to get in there first. And, but I learned how to perform. I mean, I learned how to sing into a microphone. I learned how to tolerate rejection. I also learned that if there were other people in the room, uh, sometimes someone would come over and say, I really like your lyrics, or your lyrics really moved me or really meant something to me. And if, even if it was one person, and I'd take my guitar and stomp, stomp back home, you know, uh, and try again two months later in the same place. Eventually I started to get names of those people who would come over and say, I really liked your lyrics. And I'd say, what's your name and your address? So next time I go sing, try and sing someplace. I can invite you personally, <laughs> which becomes a mailing list. And actually then after that, you, you start to gr grow an audience that way, which is probably not appropriate for your profession. <laughs> so. Can you talk a little more about um, the concept of being an introverted performer? Yeah. Uh, because I think that um, there's a conflict in academia between um, the personality type that more typically is interested in PhD level research, which is a very, can be, I imagine, I'm not a PhD, but solitary, focused, and um, internal activity, yeah. not unlike songwriting in certain ways, and yet then that very PhD is asked to come in front of a group of students and do what feels like a performance. In fact, at best, it ought to be sharing the depth and breadth of that knowledge. But it seems not unlike, you described that you were uh, termed an introvert. How do yeah. you, as how does an introvert perform? Well, as you said, it's about you feel the need to perform. You feel the need, not to perform, but you feel the need to share what it is you're talking about. I don't think of it as proselytizing in that sense, but I, I did have the sense that I had all of these songs when I was 14. I started to write them. By the time I was 16, I had about 50 songs. So I thought to myself, hey, you have these songs and they have to come out and they come out through your mouth. Okay, so they come out through my mouth in my bedroom, and that's okay. And then at some point you decide that you have to see if they're worth anything. And you have to see if they are real, and if they have any effect in the real world. And you feel that you want to share them to whoever wants to learn about them, and test them in a sense. And so that's why I would go and sing, and I was, was very driven, and I, I can't tell you how many people told me to give it up. I mean. They will just say constantly, oh, look, you know, you're, you're really, you're just too shy. You know, this was in 1976, and punk music was very popular at that time. It was about as opposite of what was fashionable at that time as you could possibly get. I had people tell me to learn to sing, to take singing lessons, to learn to read music, to, to get a day job, which I had. Uh, <laughs> You know, so you just have to have the belief that what you have to say is worth saying, and it's the one person, well in my case it was like one person or two people, and I would just sort of collect them and just keep going, because I had some belief, I mean some people would, might say that it was silly or that I was being unrealistic. I'd, I'd say a lot of people thought that I was being unrealistic by wanting to do, by wanting to even be in that profession to begin with. Um, but I guess it's just a drive that you have and a belief in, in what you're sharing. And like a delight in the beauty of it, I guess. You know, that you love it so much that you need to, for it to come out and then you sort of infect, there should be a better word than that, um, your audience with the enthusiasm that you feel within yourself. And then you sort of take it out of yourself. And that's a great feeling. So, so I think I need to do this. Um, it sounded like uh, in your response to how do you deal with performing as an introvert that the greatest way to do that is to just feel very strongly about your performance and what you have to offer. But at the same time, what you were saying, Arjun, was that the elegance of linear programming, which is what kind of did it for you, wasn't enough 
to kind of motivate that response from your audience. And so where do you, you know, draw the line and say, no, I'm doing this because I find my subject matter really intriguing and important and to heck with you guys? Or do you say, no, 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 what's important is that I entertain, perform, teach well, and therefore I need to structure that performance around what you all want to hear and, want and feel is important. I think you meet it right in the middle. Um, you figure out what feels comfortable for your own style. Uh, I think that my style has changed over the years. I've learned to ta tell more stories or learn ways to make people laugh because that's important to me and to my show, to my performance. But. Um, Ultimately, I feel that the, the content is still similar, if not the same. So that's what, it's not, it's not either or. It's you find a way to combine the two of them. That's the way I feel. You want to? I think I have a similar response. I, what I realized was that the evidence of the programming was not the right evidence. And I think that was the motivating the subject. And that you could still attempt to communicate and certainly believe in the evidence of that piece. But it needed a different way of, of motivating to the students. And, and that's, I think the struggle that I constantly have still, uh, I don't know where the right middle ground lies. And so this challenge that all of us faces are in the classroom between rigor and relevance is one that is constantly something we're struggling with. But it's, it's real, of what Suzanne said, it's sort of meeting in the middle a little bit. Well, obviously, there's a lot of technical work that goes into moving that vision and clarity from the personal to the external. And I wonder if you could perhaps repeat maybe a little bit of what you talked about in terms of your process of writing a song, because it's not easy. Right. Um, I could, I guess. Um, hmm. I'm going to try and remember what I said this morning. Uh, which is that, um, I guess for me, songwriting begins with a problem or like a feeling that won't go away or something that's really bothering you or irritating you. Uh, and then I find that for me, what works is to find some sort of container to put that feeling into that works better than, say, screaming or, you know, complaining to my sister or... You know, for me as a songwriter, I need to find a form and a structure to put these feelings into. And it's going to be sort of abstract because we don't have the song itself, you know, to work with. Maybe you could talk about Luca. Okay. The process of writing Luca. Okay. Are you familiar with the song Luca? Okay. The song Luca is written from the point of view of a nine-year-old boy who is abused. And abused by his parents, although it never says that. The song never says that. Um, and so what I start with is this is a problem. It's like a formal problem. How do I get this point of view across without being melodramatic or shouting, I'm a, I'm a boy abused by my parents, which to me would not make a very good song. And it would not be very entertaining either or instructive. So I kind of uh, wrestled with it for a few months because I, I remember when I heard the name Luca, there was a boy in my building whose name was Luca. Uh, don't tell anybody, but his real last name was Luca Vega, in fact, which is why I really noticed him. Uh, <laughs> it's because I had been receiving his mail. Um, <clears throat> so this kid's name was Luca, and he came in the door. He was nine years old. He was not an abused child. He was a very kind of normal, kind of a wise guy, skinny-looking, sensitive boy. Uh, and. I remember thinking, if I were to write a song from an abused boy's point of view, I would use that character. I would use that character to write from because he was such a wise guy, but still sort of frail and delicate at the same time. And the name Luca, too, was interesting to me because it was so ambiguous. It's not feminine. It's not masculine. It doesn't belong to any uh, nationality. You can't figure out you know, what nationality it belongs to, so it sort of cuts across all barriers. So from that moment, I thought, ah, that's what I want to do. I would like to write a song from an abused boy's point of view using the word, using the name Luca. So, okay, you've got this great idea, so now what are you going to do? You know? So 
So I decided to try and make it as simple as possible, and I started by saying, well, what would you do? How do I make this character known to an audience? And it seems obvious. You say, my name is Luca. And then after that, where are you going to take it from there? You place the child someplace. You know, you say, my name is Luca. I live on the second floor. And then you've placed the child in a context. And you say, I live upstairs from you. And so you've, you're, in a sense, you're implicating not just the neighbor, but you're implicating the audience. You're bringing the audience in. You're saying, I live upstairs from you. Yes, you've seen me before. So you're kind of implying that this is someone that the audience has seen but not really recognized. And you just sort of, and I sort of took it from there, and I tried to detail all the things that would be important to this child. What would he say without actually saying the problem, without actually saying, I'm being abused? Um, because to me that was not part of what would please me. You know, I would not be able to stand on a stage and, and have, like, cry or scream about this particular, maybe that might be someone else's, uh, approach, but it would, would not be satisfying to me as, a, as an artist or a writer. Um, so that's the way I constructed that song. It took a while, it took a couple of months to get from the idea of saying, oh, I want to write a song with the, word, with the name Luca and from the abused boy's point of view. The actual writing of the song took about two hours. Once I, found the, once I thought of my name is Luca, I live on the second floor, and then it just took like two hours and it practically wrote itself. It's just three verses. And the big surprise to me was how many people understood. Because I honestly did not think that anyone would. Um, because in the society, it's a problem that goes unrecognized a lot. You know, uh, people don't recognize the symptoms and the signs of it. So I had assumed the same thing would happen in the song. I'd say, oh, people would not know what it's about. But what happened was the subtext became sort of like, uh, people would say, oh, have you heard that song? Do you know what it's about? And then that became like this topic that people would discuss, and then they would listen to it more carefully. Um, it actually had a far bigger, uh, it sort of um, was a bigger, had more impact than I ever imagined that it would, in terms of being a big um, top 40 hit and stuff. It would be interesting to hear from some of the professors um, about any parallels that you can draw between what we've been talking about here and dilemmas um, in the classroom and here at your Well, I, I, I've got a question I'll take a little, very fast shot at that. Uh, one thing I heard was, uh, that I've certainly learned as a relatively new faculty member, is that there are a lot of basics you've, you've got to get out of the way. My own concert going experience, frankly, right? the sound system doesn't work. Right. I mean, they're real basics, yeah. but you know, if you don't get those basics right, you don't even, I mean, you don't even get a chance to get your message out because people are distracted by what's really bad performance. Uh, so as long as you get past, you know, you get a long way just by getting, overcoming the really bad things. Uh, so, you know, you show up on time, you know, and all the technical role. So I heard that echo. Uh, I actually had a question somewhat related to something we struggle with, which is, in academics, we're not quite in teaching. It's this issue of who the, cus the customer. Our students are customers. Uh, you know, part of what we do is to deliver material that we think is important, and that's part of our job. And yet, we worry about feedback. One thing I was interested by uh, is just briefly looking at your, at your website. It's apparent that you now have this connection Maybe you always had it, but a connection with the audience that perhaps you didn't have before. And I'm curious to know how you grapple with this as an artist. Uh, are, is your audience your customer now? How do you deal with this feedback? Do you try and change who you are uh, to better? Because of the website? Or because of the comments of your audience? <laughs> no, no, it's so, the same as it always was um, to me. In fact, I tried something recently uh, with my last album, which I will not do again, which was that uh, while I was working on the album, because I interact with the people on the internet, there's like a news group of about 300 people about, uh, that are worldwide. So they'll write questions about the songs, and sometimes I'll answer them, and, and sometimes I don't. But I thought, oh, this will be interesting, because now I'm doing this. Uh, um, I can show them things that are in process. So I made the mistake of uh, revealing a couple of my thoughts about what the next album was going to be called, and got immediate feedback that it was trite, 
uh, <laughs> not up to my usual standards, um, this and that, you know, all kinds of discussion that was going in the wrong direction that I didn't like, you know, and so I was thinking, oh, geez, you know, I, this is a working, it's a working title. You know, I was thinking of Love Hotel or Slice of Life and getting immediate feedback, no, no, this won't do. Um, so I decided for myself, like, just choose the final title and then release it and just the hell with it. That's what I said to myself. Just because um, ultimately, if you're not finished, you know, if, if the process isn't done, then, then they're, you're, they're responding to something that's half-baked. So if you were to try and work out a, a, a plan in front of your, your students, then they'd get bored and they'd start saying what they didn't like and they'd, and they'd be right. So that taught me not to work things out in public. <laughs> Well, just to respond quickly, one of the things that happens to us is we don't have, I don't know if it's the luxury, but we don't get to perform the same thing over again, whatever, I, don't, I, don't, I can't, for some of the performers I've gone to hear, I don't even like to think about how many times they have to sing the same song. You know, we get a couple cracks at it to, to learn, and then we have to decide after doing it a couple times, look, how much do we change this now? Uh, did it work well enough? Because uh, you know, we, we can change the words every time we do it, in addition to the, the way that we perform it. And so it's a, it's a real challenge. When do you gauge what the audience is saying and they're saying, you know, not, you know, and when do you just stick with your, what you feel is, is right? How often do you experiment with some other issues that, again, perhaps is a little different. It's, it's maybe more on the creative side of what you do uh, rather than the performing side. I think that sounds like knowing when to stop. It sounds like knowing when is the right moment to say, okay, this is the, this is the proper form to teach this in. I, and you might change it a little bit from audience to audience, but there's got to be a moment when your instinct says, this is the best way to present this subject, you know, for me. And it, it's, it's up to your own style as well. It's you and the subject together presented to the class. And you, you, your instinct will tell you, it seems to me. I guess perhaps I just wanted to, to relate to you a, a little <coughs> anecdote about a song of Suzanne that triggered while I was doing the research to to put together the session in that course I was listening to all her songs all her, all her albums and meanwhile I was teaching in the core and here comes the time for the midterm review and I wanted to, we, we, we talk about collective learning in the classroom as being the focus of, of our effort. I wanted to convey that to the students and I stumbled across Suzanne's great lyrics, um, uh, the uh, white, uh, white uh, wooden horse song, I don't know if you know that song, which says, um, um, I, I came out of the darkness holding one thing, a little white wooden horse, and this is actually Suzanne's white wooden horse that I was holding inside. And for reasons that have to do with the story, but not pertinent to here, it says, and when I'm dead, please tell them this, what was wood became alive. And I thought that uh, one of the phenomena I observed as starting as a teacher, I barely have two years of, of experience teaching, but something that struck me immediately was that a cohort has a life of its own. Each cohort is different, they have a personality. And one of the challenges, I thought, the key challenge for, for us as teachers is to bring that, that personality to come out and, and, and express itself. And I thought that, that metaphor of the white wooden horse coming alive captured that. So we tried that uh, last year in 65, and Barbara actually was kind of the, And so Barbara, if you want to comment on your side of the story, uh, what that meant. Um, I think that, that what that meant actually okay. evolved over the course of the class because you know the experience as students at first was you know we came in and Professor Solansky had this whole set of rules you know he took roll call and it was very strict environment he expressed this concept of collective learning and that we were going to have to do it sounded like a lot more work than, than maybe we anticipated I was relating to Suzanne she was describing as she, some of your lyrics the audience has to work we have to do a little work to really understand so it was this concept that it's worth it sometimes to work. So here were these lyrics about this white wooden horse. And when I'm dead, tell them if you would, that the white wooden horse became alive. 
And I think most of us sat there and we saw the words on the screen and we listened to Cezanne's voice singing the song and some of us already knew the song and we thought, like, what does this have to do with strategy? <laughs> you know, and we couldn't make the connection. But over the course of time, about the fourth or maybe the fifth class in, you couldn't miss that something had changed in the classroom. Because instead of the situation where at first we were in a heavy duty cold call environment, Professor Solansky was, you had to come to this class prepared or you would be in trouble. And so we were all in the defensive waiting to be cold called. But there was, I would, it's a word we don't usually use in academia. There was tremendous love from Professor Solansky about the subject material and about us, his students. And somehow that became, it overcame the fear we had, we began to realize that he was really on our side. He was singing with his back to the audience. Um, we were all kind of in a group together in this process of coming to understand how to strategize. And as he played the song, I think three times in the course, during the course, on the last day also, and we really came to realize what it meant. In fact, we were wood when we started out, and we were very much alive, really starting with about the fourth or fifth class. And that liveliness just um, accelerated, almost it seemed exponentially, until by the last class, nobody was raising hands. People were talking on top of each other. And I think Professor Solansky had a bigger problem just trying to <laughs> structure all the energy that we were throwing at the front of the classroom. So it was a complete shift. Very exciting. And so that process was thanks to Barbara was the academic rep and she helped people make sense of the, something at the beginning didn't look quite. <laughs> and so you see what inspiration came from from this event and what your lyrics are going to us. And Thank you. So it's great to have you.